We saw a real opportunity to kind of look at Inside Tucson Business and all the wonderful things that they're doing for the community and then take Gangplank, which is a collaborative workspace environment that's an international nonprofit. It's founded on the principles of collaboration over competition and providing a community space where people can come in, grab a desk, start working and collaborating and being innovators in the greater Tucson community. Um, and then initially we talked, decided, sorry, get Mike here, who's the uh, executive director of Imagine Bayer Tucson, to kind of come in and talk about the transportation issue a little bit more than that. If you have any questions about Gangplank and what we do, you can come find me afterwards, or Tank here, or <laughs> Roger over there. There's a whole bunch of people. You can just come up and ask and kind of see what Gangplank does a little bit more. Um, but without further ado, I'll hand it to Mike. Thanks, Ryan. Yep. Hello. Um, I promise you we're going to talk about transportation. But before I do, uh, if, if those of you who know about Imagine Greater Tucson, you know that we really do like taking a lot of polls and surveys. So a very quick survey on the subject of monsoons. <laughs> who here is against monsoons? <laughs> Anybody for monsoons? <laughs> okay, I realize that's kind of a ridiculous question, right? Because monsoons are going to come whether we're for them or not. We're not going to take a vote on it. Well, we might, but we're not going to, and it wouldn't matter. But I want to relate that because really and truly what we're going to talk about today are some things that are happening outside of our region that, like monsoons, we don't control. They're going to happen. Now, we don't know how big it's going to be for us. We don't know when it's going to happen. But we do know that something is going to change the way that we move about this region, the way we live, and our economic status here. And we can choose to either plan for it, like monsoons, and build storm drains, and low water crossings and those things that you have to to be able to manage the effects of it, or we can ignore it and it's going to come anyway. So that really is kind of the subject of how we're going to go about the rest of this. Now, a couple of quick administrative notes. One, there will not be a PowerPoint. Power corrupts. PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> I firmly believe this. Uh, so if you want to have notes after this presentation, you'll have to call me or read the articles that we're producing, and it seems like a weekly basis now on a web and out in the press. Uh, two, this is meant to be a conversation. Now, I am going to present some facts and some thoughts and opinions, but please do ask questions. And afterwards, I do want a conversation period after this, because this is all about hearing what you have to say and fully understanding kind of the ramifications of what's going on here. So, we cool with that so far? Excellent. Thank you very much. Once again, my name is Mike. I am the Executive Director for Imagine Greater Tucson. And Imagine Greater Tucson is not a transportation planning agency, nor are we an economic development agency, which begs the question, how in the heck did we come to be talking about transportation and Interstate 11 and all the other things going along with that? So let me back up just a little bit. Imagine Greater Tucson really started about three or four years ago with the idea of addressing our region problems from a regional perspective, from a popular perspective. And it started out with one of many problems was, why aren't we retaining our 20-year-olds? Why are the youth of our generation leaving and going elsewhere? So we asked the community a couple of questions. One, what do you value? What are the things that you really like about our region, the way you live here? And we got some interesting answers. We got 60 answers, in fact. Our 60 shared values. And they frame everything we do now. And guess what? They're very common sense. I'm not going to go through all 60 of them, but I would direct you to our website. Uh, but there are things like we value our unique cultural identity, we value our natural resources, we value our ability to move around the region freely, and we certainly value our education systems and, and, and what both levels of the education system can produce for us. So with that in mind, now we had a common community conversation. Instead of saying, we don't like this about you, or we don't like this about that side, we were all able to say, well, we'll at least agree on these 60 things. So then the next thing we asked was, based on these 60 principles, how would you like to see our region grow? How will we accommodate the change that is coming on us? The next million people or so to enter our region, whether it's 20 years from now or 50 years from now, where are they going to live? We looked at a trend. Now, this trend map here shows if we did nothing, where people would end up living. These marigold colored blobs out here are where if, again, if we did nothing, people would naturally settle in these areas. And if you look at it, here's the Tona Odom Reservation. Uh, and people living on the back side of that, think of the commute times, think of the amount of infrastructure we would have had to have built, think of all the things that would go along with that and what we would have to maintain, and remember that we probably run on potholes on a daily basis here anyway. 
and think of the fact that the average eastern Pima County resident maintains more, more linear miles of road than almost any other place in the United States, so no wonder we have potholes because we don't generate enough tax to support what we've already built. So that led, imagine Greater Tucson, understanding that people said they don't want this. People said they wanted more compact, more dense areas where we have current population centers like Salarita, Green Valley, Vail, Morana, Oro Valley, etc. That's let's let's build those up and, and concentrate on those and let's do less of this out here on the backside, the Tohono Odom Reservation, where we just try to spend more money to support it. So, IGT, knowing that response and having that vision in our head that the people gave us after engaging for over two years and ten thousand people, we decided to say, let's focus on the infrastructure because you build development where there are roads, where there's infrastructure. Otherwise, the developer has to build those roads, and that just increases costs and makes them less, less uh, um, competitive, right? So we did. We started looking at the infrastructure here. But as we did, we started, had to look at the complete holistic picture, and we started looking at things outside of our region that were going to impact that. And we came upon a startling, I'll call it a fact, but certainly a startling projection from ADOT. Right now, ADOT reckons that on I-10 and 19 through our area, 20% of the traffic right now is freight. Every fifth vehicle is a truck carrying something to, through, or from our region. <coughs> but with the events that are happening, and I'll just illuminate a few, one, just increased in economic state, you know, stature overall. We're, we, our, our country is growing back. We're coming back out of recession, so there will be more trade throughout the region. Two. Interstate 11 and the discussion around that, and the completion of what's called the Canamex Highway. And then three, the Deepwater Port at Guaymas, and the increased trade coming up from Mexico, and just Mexican uh, uh, resurgence or, or growth in the economy as, as, as on its own. ADOT reckons that that number of 20% is going to grow to 50%, which begs the question, how are we going to move through our region when every other vehicle on our interstate system is a truck? So we realized that unless we address these big questions first, we'd never keep pace with these other changes that are coming around us. Again, like the monsoons, these things are going to happen. Our response is how we're going to deal with it. Okay. So let me show you my beautiful artwork here. Yes. Really, clearly a frustrated artist, right? What is it? Okay, for, for, for those of you who are either artistically or geographically challenged, this is North America. Okay? So we've got the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf, and of course our, our, our Pacific Ocean and, and the Sea of Cortez here. And you know, with nothing else on it, you can see that... Uh, Realize something here. This is the only piece of old Mexico that the United States actually bought. And they bought it for a reason. They bought it for transportation. They needed a way to get from the ports and the production centers of the eastern hunk of the United States to the western half. They wanted to be able to move goods they were starting to get from Asia to the centers in the middle and to, and to the east. And the best way to do that was not to go through or over the mountains that's really painful. Anybody that's driven across the mountains will know that. It was to build a railroad that dodged around the mountains and connected the country east to west. So they did. We bought Tucson and the region here, the Gadsden Purchase in 1854, I believe. Somebody can correct me. And by 18, I think, 85, the railroad finally arrived. By the way, that's kind of an interesting number to keep up, because when we talk about transportation, we're talking in decades, right? We're planning ahead decades. So a lot of the effects of what's going to happen here isn't next year. It's next decade or two or three or four. But anyway, so Tucson, just by virtue of the fact that we had the ability, at least at that time, to produce copper, cattle, cotton, and citrus, right? We became a great little point along the way. Oops. Fixing to use the wrong color here. We became a great little point along this railroad where all those goods and commodities could get on the railroad. We had water, we had fuel in the mountains, wood for the trains, and it was easy to get those things and get them to the rest of the country. Later on, as Mexico started growing, and they connected into this, 
Tucson became a really cool three-way intersection for trade, and a market sprung up. And we became, we always were, but we became even more of a market town because we were the obvious place for Northwest Mexico and the Intermountain region of the United States to be able to connect and get goods to markets. And as we know, when you form a market, businesses come to take advantage of that so they can get access to goods. Eventually, of course, we built an interstate system that just magnified that effect. And we were living life pretty well. Now, remember 1992, I think it was adopted in 1995, the NAFTA Treaty? After all the kicking and screaming about what it was going to do and what it wasn't going to do, what it ended up doing for us and for Mexico was substantial. Mexico is now our number two trading partner in the world. And here, at the entry point for so much of what's coming out of northwest Mexico, we were able to make a lot of money off of that. In fact, Mexican tourism trade alone in Tucson, just, in, just literally in this 30 or, or you know, 100 square mile chunk of terrain, is about a billion dollars a year. That's significant. That's money coming from outside the country, much less the region, that enriches us through its tax base, through the wages and jobs and things that it, that it, that it spawns off. So again, we, we've done pretty well off of this idea of an intersection. But the other thing that NAFTA did was it demanded, by international treaty, that Mexico and the United States build an international highway that would connect all three countries. Well, and they did except they stopped in Las Vegas. All right, and now we have a 92, a, a federal highway, but not an interstate, and anybody that's driven to Vegas knows it's not the easiest ride in the world, that connects all the way from uh, Phoenix to Vegas, right? So we've got this kind of weird little, little gap in our, in our structure. So if you've heard of Interstate 11, anybody in the press? Interstate 11. Interstate 11 is the U.S. official designated term for this final little piece of what's come to know, become known as the Canamax Highway. And what that will do for us, if we choose to let it happen, is it'll turn Tucson from three-way intersection into a four-way intersection. It'll also extend what's been started to become known as the, the Sun Corridor, which is really and truly, uh, if you look at it in very finite terms, the stretch between the outer limits of Phoenix and the outer limits of Tucson, but in reality can easily be extended to include Nogales and region south, and up to Flagstaff, and regions west. So, this is the idea, this is why we're talking about this today, because what's happening right now, ADOT and the, Arizona, or the Nevada Department of Transportation are doing a study on what the effects of this interstate level would be. Is it a desirable thing? Is it something that we want to do? And, more importantly, where would it go? Because it's not a foregone conclusion that it'll come to Tucson. You may recall in 2007, the Board of Supervisors actually voted, a, voted in a resolution for no new interstates. Back to my map. The second map. You can see these maps are getting dog-eared. I've given this, sh this, this presentation a couple of times now. So here, here's us. Here's Tucson, Sorita, Moran and Oro Valley up here, Vail out that way. Here's our current interstate system. And going back to that factoid of 20% freight traffic to 50% freight traffic, where's it going to go? Because we're already pretty much at capacity. Anybody that's been on the I-10, I-19 interchange at about lunchtime, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a bit stiff. So how are we going to accommodate if... ADOT decides that this is the route for I-11. That's not the foregone conclusion. Because there are other options. Texas already has an interstate that goes down past I-10 all the way to Laredo and then up all the way to Canada. It's I-35. Already, we reckon that Texas has been able to siphon off, because they have this infrastructure, 10% of the freight traffic that would come to our region, because they've got the infrastructure to do it, and nobody has to dodge up I, or, uh, Highway 92. They just get on I-35 and head north. Texas has also done a great job in investing in their infrastructure. Dallas-Fort Worth 
not only has multiple interstates running through it, but of course it has Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, and even better, they built a completely separate airport just for freight that lies on the rail lines, the highway lines, and everything else. So there is competition, and they are investing. In fact, they, the Texas Department of Transportation is investing heavily into northern Mexican transportation infrastructure in order to facilitate Mexican roadways being built to Laredo, Texas, or Laredo, uh, Mexico, Nuevo Laredo. So we have competition. That's outside the state. Inside the state, there's Yuma, there's potentially Benson. Because if the supervisors have already voted they don't want any new interstates, and we don't have the capacity through our region to be able to handle what is going to come our way, never, nonetheless what we already have, why wouldn't ADOT want to capitalize on this and try to prevent Texas from taking some of that freight traffic away? So like the monsoons, there are events out there that we have to face. We have to decide how we want to do this. But there are trade-offs. Where would we build a road system? We're kind of limited. There's only so much we can widen. And there's only so much that the population is willing to deal with. After all, I mean, we're dealing with construction now, right? I mean, it would seem like endless construction if we went to 10 lanes or more through the area. And maybe that's an answer. I don't know. Again, I'm not a transportation planner. But nonetheless, it's going to cause some pain regardless of what we do. We could double deck. Anybody that's ever driven on a double deck highway system, it's not that great. And then once you've done it, you're kind of stuck. You know, it's very expensive to build, and it's more expensive to tear down and redo 30, 40, 50 years down the road. Just ask Austin, Austin Texas. They're stuck with this thing they built back in, the, I guess, the 60s or 70s, and it's kind of a pain. And it's dangerous, too. It increases traffic accidents. So here's an other answer. Uh, ADOT is, is, I just found this out yesterday, does have a proposal from Pima County for a new highway system, something that would tee in with I-11. I'm not going to draw on my map because I can't. I only have one map. But picture something that would tee off of somewhere around Marana or north Pima County and go around the backside of the Suero National Park, sort of threading the eye of the needle between the Ironwood National Forest uh, in Suero National Park and the Tohono O'odham Reservation, and then come back in and join 19 somewhere in the vicinity of Sorita. This goes along with Chuck's earlier uh, proposal of a, a bypass uh, something along Pima Mine Road and then coming out this way, uh, connecting in somewhere around Rita Ranch Road. What this would eff effectually do is create a kind of a 270 degree arc around our region, which would act as a relief valve for traffic that's coming from the east, the south, or the north and west, who have no intention of coming here, to go around our city, not clog our arteries, and still, for the rest of us to have access to a network that is not only international, but because of our airports, which we can't forget, truly intercontinental. There's another factor with that. I've got Mike Levine sitting in the back of the room back there. We have an international port just opened up, what, a month ago, Mike? Yeah, for, just opened up with the idea, when you say international port, I mean, you're thinking water, you're thinking ships and things. No. This allows us to be able to take goods, containerize them, get them custom stamped, custom steeled right here, and ship them directly anywhere in the world via plane, train, or ship. Absolutely. So this, this gives us a great capability. I think, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, I think I'm using your numbers. You can right now put a 40-foot container on a flatbed truck and ship it to the Port of L.A. for about $1,800. You can take that same container, put it on a train here at the International Port, have it already sealed and custom, you know, custom stamped, and send it to Beijing or, or Shanghai for $1,800. So you see the cost savings there and what this sort of allows us to do. Let's talk about the airports. Now, I'm not picking one airport or another. We've got some great options. Tucson International Airport, underutilized both for passenger and way underutilized for freight. They already have facilities on site that we could use for freight to send it out there. We've got uh, Ryan Airfield, which is almost 100% private aviation, 
could be expanded to be a much larger field because the space is already there. And again, because of access, and especially if we did a loop system, have access to bigger planes throughout the world. We've got Pinal Air Park, again outside the county, but I'm about the region, not just about the county. Pinal Air Park will already handle some of the biggest airplanes in the world. Factoring in a couple of other factors, like we have 365 days of good weather for the most part. We operate continuously and we have logistics predictability. And the fact that we're not Phoenix, so we don't have crowded skies. Planes don't orbit around wasting fuel waiting for a place to land. This puts us in a really good position to take advantage of a network of roads and a network of rail to really and truly be intercontinental. We could become that marketplace if we wanted to. But there are downsides. Remember I said it earlier on, the people wanted a more compact region. They wanted more of a dense urban thing. And the fact of the matter is that we can only support so many roads and so much infrastructure before we just overbuild. If we built a road, around the back side of this area. We're building it through some of the more sensitive areas, obviously, Saguaro National Park, huge tourist draw, millions of dollars a year, people coming in from outside just to go to the, the national parks. We have to acknowledge the fact that the Tohono O'odham own, I mean, as, as sovereign nations, own and have rights to these lands, and we have to figure out how to do that in a way that respected and, 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 and dealt with them in an honorable way. And we have to also understand that just the impact of a highway out here is going to have some impact on the wildlife and the wildlife corridors and the way creatures move about our region. I mean, we are the only place in the, in the United States that has jaguars still. So. And we'd like to be able to keep those, right? Or at least the one that we have. Um, here's another thing. People want it more compact, right? So what happens if you build a road up through here and all this land that really nobody can get to very easily and suddenly you have a highway there? Well, how do, you, how do you control the growth that might come off of that? Now, these are things that can be mitigated, but we're going to have to figure this out if this is what we want to do. So, questions so far? Yes, ma'am. Um, the I can't speak specifically to, to the, the Phoenix Loop. What I can say is that one of the alignment options they're looking at uh, for I-11 would more than likely tee into that loop and and incorporate part of it. You know, one of the options is that they just uh, funnel in some of that traffic on I-10 for the stretch between Phoenix and, and maybe Marana or, you know, our region at least. And another one is a, is a, is a completely parallel highway. Uh, an, an option that is being discuss, discussed is going completely outside of our region and through, um, I can never remember the name of that little junction out there west of Phoenix that we all drive through on the way to San Diego. Helaban. Yeah, Gila Bend, there we go. And, and through Gila Bend and Ajo or, or out to Yuma. So, I mean, there, there are a lot of options. Another one might be the backside of the Catalinas also bypassing our region. Now, let me tell you some timing about those kinds of decisions. <clears throat> They're about halfway through the study period. And they intend, it was a 24 month period authorized by Congress to do this, and it's between ADOT and Nevada DOT. <clears throat> They'll publish, they've already published, as in just this last week, a sort of a, a summary report for the northern half of this, the stretch along uh, Highway 92. They will publish a recommendation next summer, so about a year from now is the target date, that will encompass the entire corridor from Mexico all the way through uh, Nevada. We can put, we can have input into that until about February, March time frame. They haven't chosen when the cutoff date is. But what we'll have input on isn't whether it goes through Aver Valley or not. It'll be, do we want it coming through Tucson? Or do we want it going through Gila Bend? Or any of the other options they say. Now, understanding the impact, the economic impact that could come to us, and the trade-offs, the negative sides that we're going to have to deal with, just to include construction alone, is, is going to be a big deal. We really have to think about that and educate ourselves. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you said that Pima County is the 
is actually put in a proposal? <laughs> is it actually in regards to the specific study that Arizona ADOT is doing? It is uh, to show, I believe, and I, 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 would, I would ask a county rep to, to actually clarify this, but my understanding of it is, is to show that if I-11 were to come here, there, we could handle it. There's a way to show that we could, we could deal with it in a way that wouldn't focus everything through the middle of downtown Tucson, that wouldn't cause congestion, but at the same time allow for the free movement of goods, people, and services from Canada to Mexico. And within that proposal, have they done any sort of environmental studies or preliminarily taken a look at that? Yes, they have. And I'll reflect back to the 2007 vote, which was a you know, route through Agra Valley. And I've, I'm, I'm literally reading this off the letter from Chuck Huckleberry to uh, Cherie Campbell at PAG. And I'm happy to make this available. This is all public information, so that I'm, you know, there's nothing behind the scenes here. Um, the route, the alignment that they're proposing through this area has taken into account a lot of the concerns that were raised in 2007 about wildlife corridors and impact on the national parks and the, and the, and the, uh, the, the national forest out there and the national monument. So I believe so. I'm not an expert. I'm just a guy who can bring out the issues and, and, and get people talking about it. But the, those are real huge concerns. Now, I will tell you this. You're kind of segueing into, and I'll get to you in a moment, sir. IGT's role in this, because we're not planners, we're not uh, economic developers, is to gather that conversation. So we're, we're reaching out to. We've already formed a coalition with Arizona Forward and with the Sonoran Institute to start this community conversation. So you're, you're really kind of the first piece of this. You're, you're the inaugural class. Uh, the whole idea that it's, we, we need to go out to the community, and not just Tucson, but I mean, literally each of the jurisdictions and Vail and Green Valley as well, to see how they feel about it and to educate them on what's out there, to, to answer exactly these kinds of questions, because they do have to be considered. It's not a foregone conclusion that, one, the interstate will come here, or two, how we'll deal with it when it gets here. I believe you have one. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Brilliant question. <laughs> and I asked that same question uh, yesterday at the at the big ADOT thing when they unveiled the, their their latest study. Um, the short answer is yes. As some of you may know, uh, ADOT, in a separate parallel effort, recently unveiled three alignments for a rail line between Phoenix and Tucson. Okay, and understanding that markets have to. Um, it's not just the free movement of goods and services, it's the free movement of labor to make it, make it work, right? So yes, they're looking at incorporating all the modes so that it magnifies the effect instead of just saying, no, we're, we're only talking about a rail line or we're only talking about an airport. It's everything, truly intermodal. And, and that should be out in the study. So I would say I-11 is the catalyst for this and the Deepwater Port at Guaymas is the catalyst for this, but it, it, sh it, it will incorporate all of that. And I, the point I also made, by the way, yesterday was focusing on it from the Tucson end of things. This isn't just about uh, Las Vegas and Phoenix. This is about us, right? We need to increase the flow of people. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, undocumented folks. I'm talking about the people who come up here and want to work and want to buy stuff in our stores and want to use Tucson for, an ed, uh, for a vacation and the Tucsonans that want to go down to Rocky Point and all those places south, we should extend that rail line south as well. You know? So, and, and, and they said, yes, that would probably be a natural extension of what we're talking about. So, nice. all those pieces of the conversation. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Sorry. Okay. You, sir. Me? Yes. All right. So you can talk about, as far as quality of life issues, if one out of every two trucks on the road become... Freight line moving through, and Texas is on the way to alleviating some of that by building increased capacity to funnel some of that traffic away. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the economic impacts of why we want to make sure that those ra those freight lines actually come through Tucson, and why we would want the infrastructure here to support that? Because it's a business issue on that side versus a quality of life issue of having all of those trucks on the road. That is a very good question. That really is the first thing we should consider. Why would we want to have that? Because it is a very real option. We could say, no, send it anywhere else. We don't want that to come our way. But by doing that, we do limit our economic options. You know, if we want to provide, if we want, if we want to provide a place for our kids to be able to stay, which was one of the reasons why IGT was, was initially founded, we got to have jobs for them. we got to have a future for them. 
I mean, I think I, uh, Katie's a great example. I, I think Katie would tell you, as a native Tucsonan who desperately wants to stay here, you know, you get, there's plenty of jobs, well, I won't say plenty, but there are jobs for the folks coming right out of the university and the junior colleges. There are. But you get to a point about late 20s or early 30s and that middle management thing where the jobs that you need to be able to progress aren't here. Those little check the block things that, yeah, I was a supervisor of this or a manager of that or whatever, and they got to go somewhere else. And, and when they go somewhere else, oftentimes you know, they make a life, why would they come back? So we have to address that. I mean, that's a, it is a real option. We could say, I don't want it. Or we, and, and then we have to deal with these other effects of then we limit our economic choices and our economic options. And is that really what we want to do? Or we could say we want it, and then we're going to have to figure out how to deal with the effects of that. And that really is it. These are some tough choices. You know, let's face it. We may be a 200-plus-year-old city. I think, actually, it's exactly my age plus 200 years, so a 248-year-old city. <laughs> but we're a teenager when it comes to our development, and we're going through those really difficult teenage years of things. And, and, and so we're going to face, and that's fine. If we say no new interstates, we're still going to have I-10 and I-19. I mean, there's, they aren't going away. We're still going to have to deal with increased freight traffic through here because it's still going to happen. It may not happen as much, but it will happen to some degree. So we're not really wishing anything away by doing that. Uh, but we do certainly limit our ability to grow and to be able to take advantage of that truly global marketplace that could develop here. I, I'm sorry, Andrew asked one in the back. Yes, sir. Um, for those who are really interested in getting into more in-depth information, um, Arizona Department of Transportation has all of these studies online, and they have re really great uh, background information. So if you go to the uh, adot.org site or .gov site, um, they have really good information, the background. And all the process is there, so if you want to be involved in the process, it's very easy, and they encourage you to be involved in the process. But I'll make it just easier for, for you. Yes, there is a site just for I-11 as I well. There is. The issues around uh, the passenger train, right. rail, transportation piece, there's a special site for that. But if you go to the Arizona Department of Transportation site from there, you can branch to all those other resources. Well, like I said, I'm going to make it even easier for you, though. We are rebuilding our website. We'll have it. I, our target date is to unveil it on the 1st of August. Uh, we're going to put all those resources on there, as well as commentary, public commentary that you all provide on what, on what the effects are and what the questions are. Um, over the next six months, starting on or about the 1st of September, we are planning on going out to the community and gathering the questions, posing what the options are and what, 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 what the realities are outside the reason, and starting to gather the questions that you all have about it so that we can effectively have a further conversation over the next couple of years about what that would look like and whether this is the option or whether we double deck or whatever. I, 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 I'm not espousing any one of them. I'm just saying we're going to have to figure out how that's going to look. And so we, that's the community conversation. That's the whole point of it. Somebody else had a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what was the purpose behind the um, elimination of wanting any new um, pilots? You know, I think what it was, and I remember this at the time, but I wasn't engaged in my current capacity, so I've kind of just, nah. <laughs> uh, it was, one, there wasn't the need yet. I-11 was not a point of discussion. So there wasn't that sort of drive that something was going to happen whether we wanted it or not. Uh, the Deepwater Port to the south was still, you know, kind of a far off maybe kind of thing. Uh, right now it's actually being built. So there really wasn't the need to make a decision, at least in the popular opinion. And I think the other part of it was the very real environmental and, and uh, um, uh, sovereignty concerns about building something out here. And I think it was just a bridge too far at the time. But again, with all these other conditions from outside the region that will impact us, and let's face it, trade with Mexico, our number two trading partner, through us to Canada, our number one trading partner, that's a national concern. The nation is going to do something about that, whether Tucson wants to or not. And again, whether it comes through Tucson or one of our sister cities or through Texas, the nation is more concerned that it happens, not really where it happens. So I think it's really the convergence of events. Yes, sir? In the Union Pacific uh, switchyard. Ah, you're talking about the classification yard they're talking about up here in Red Rocks, right? Okay. Um, and, and again, Mike. Correct me if I go astray here. We have 
as, as everyone who's driven around Barraza Aviation knows, we've got a, a, a switch yard here, a, a freight yard, where you can onload and offload goods. What is being talked about up at Red Rock is not a, a freight yard for onloading and offloading. It's a classification yard, which means this is where they build the trains. Miles and miles and miles and miles of track, parallel tracks, you know, 10, 15, 20, however many it's going to be, so that they can build the 100-car uh, long trains and get them to where they need to go. Logistics, when you're talking about trains and ships, is all about staging those containers so that when you get to the next rail station where it's going to go, you drop off the last car instead of having to break the whole train apart and put it back together again. It's time, it's money, it's all those things. Right, Mike? Okay, cool. So that's what they're talking about up here. And UP is going to do it somewhere. It's going to happen somewhere. Whether it happens here, where we might be able to take advantage of it, or in New Mexico, or somewhere west of Phoenix, that's to be decided. Well, the last I heard, it was stuck in state trust land. That's last I heard, too. That, you know, state trust, as mandated by the, 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 the state constitution, has to find a, a, you know, a good use, has to find a, 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 a payoff for being able to give up that land. And so... It's in that process. I, I, I think we would be naive to say there's not a little bit of politics involved, uh, but who's to say? <laughs> Somebody else. There was a hand up at some point. Yes, sir. Is Mexico fully uh, on board with us as far as the deep water port and Wyoming? They've uh, all of this network that's going to happen. They've invested twenty million dollars, which is a lot of pesos, yep. into creating that port, and construction is already underway. That's going to be a reality. So the question isn't so much whether they're on board. The question is, where's all that freight that's going to come into that deep water port? Because please remember a couple of facts. One, L.A. and Long Beach, they're at capacity. They can't build any more wharfs. You already have sh ships stacked up outside the breakwaters waiting to get in. So there's already a, a, a demand for another deep water port. The other thing is just shifting trade patterns in general. Back to my artwork. <laughs> This is why I don't do PowerPoint. I just be flicking around and people get bored. Um, so, back in the day, China, our number one trading partner in the East, right? But here's a couple of realities. Y'all heard of nearshoring? Okay, here's what's driving some of the things that are driving nearshoring. Uh, Chinese labor has gotten more expensive. It's not as cheap as it once was. Two, their quality control still is not where it should be. Three, ships burn oil to cross all that water. Oil has gotten more expensive. So shipping costs, labor costs, and just the demand for higher quality have caused U.S. markets to look for better places to manufacture their goods, more competitive places. Some of that's come from Southeast Asia. Now think about the trajectory here. Ships can come this way from China or from Southeast Asia and South Asia come this way, which suddenly makes Waimas look a lot more attractive because you're not going around the uh, Baja California. Another thing. Just a simple fact. Mexican labor has become better. Quality control is as good as anywhere else in the world. And technically, they, the Mexican labor can do what they need to do. So it's there. And oh, by the way, even though it's more expensive than Chinese labor, the transportation costs start to negate that. So you're seeing more and more companies do nearshoring now. They're taking their, their, their labor from offshore and putting it in places like Mexico where they can get better quality products, where they have a better outlook for the future is being able to develop the labor pool and the technical pool they need, and it doesn't cost them as much to get. So again, a little old Tucson here, we are right in the geographic sweet spot for having that trade come through. Can yes. I follow up question? Absolutely. And I'm not the devil's advocate, that's not me, but are the unions going to fight this court of Wyoming, the, the L.A. unloading unions? I don't know. I really don't. I know this. I mean, th there's not really a whole lot more. They're busy as they can be. They, if you can't get any more trade through here, we're already shoving as much stuff through that pipeline as we possibly can. I don't think they're, it's not like they're going to be stealing ships from here. Are we going to be in competition with them? Well, Mexico yes. might be, but then again, Mexican unions versus American unions. I, I know where the Mexican government's going to vote. <laughs> so I, 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 I don't I don't know how much of a factor. That's the first time anybody's ever asked me that question. So I don't know. Yes, sir. Actually. <clears throat> The Mexicans are more concerned about the Canadians building their deep water port up north in BC than they are worried about the ports in California and in Oregon and Washington. They're far more concerned about BC. And then you, sir. The other thing that you've got going on is the expansion of the Panama Canal. Absolutely. A 
find this now. At some point in the future, you're going to be able to take a container there and go to Europe. Yes. Okay? And that's a big game changer. We don't know what kind of impact that expansion of Panama Canal is going to have. But Wymus is in the right spot. Absolutely. Wymus is going to be a boon to us no matter what we do. If we, if we say no new interstates, no new freeways, no loop system, let it go somewhere else, we're still going to get trade coming through here. Because just geographically, it's easier for trucks to come from Wymus than to go around the Sierra Madre Mountains and go up to Texas. And there's already the interstate infrastructure, the Carateria uh, Quince, uh, that takes it straight to Tucson and not have to build a new highway out to Yuma or someplace like that. So we're going to get something. It's got to increase. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a hand up back here in the back. Ma'am. Um, I think it's going to impact them. I'll let somebody answer, else answer how well they're doing. My, my understanding is they're doing very well. I think it's really going to be revolutionary for them. And if we built this infrastructure here, I think it would be even more so. In the last five years, the Maquiladoras in Sonora and Chihuahua have just, they, they saw a little bit of a um, subsiding of activity when a lot of labor went to China. But the nearshoring effect that you just talked about a few minutes ago, has really strengthened and even increased the Maquiladoras activity in the states just south of the border to us. And, and, and oh, by the way, I don't think it's a real shock to, to Sonins here uh, that you know one of the best things we can do for a strong and secure border policy is to have a strong and secure Mexico where jobs are available and with our partners instead of viewed as in this competition. So um, you were going to say something. I was just wondering if you had any information on the port of entry and, and expansion. Boy, that is the hot button issue when we talk about expanding down 19 because let's face it, you know, it's kind of like the last yard. Uh, it, we, we can do all this wonderful interstate here, but if we don't do something about 19, which is four lanes, you know, for most of its life, what's the point? So, it, and, it's, and, and, and it is the, the staffing problem at the port of entry. We've got, what, 18 lanes at Mariposa, but only staff for, I don't know, a fraction of that. It, it, exactly. So the, capa the, the physical capacity is there. But here's the other side of that. The reality is, you know, once we start building this infrastructure and the demand is there, then it becomes a political issue. I'm looking back at our, 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 our rep for our, for our rep. Uh, it becomes a political issue to, to, to demand Congress staff the border crossing points to capacity so that we can take advantage of it. But... The physical infrastructure is there. It could happen. It's just a matter of hiring people and putting them on station. Yes, sir. Um, if, if, the, if this all results in more population, do we have enough water? Current estimates on water now, and that's a really, really good question. I would tell you that's probably where IGT will go next or certainly one of our next efforts. Current estimates are that we can supply with, with what we are able to bring in now about 2.2 million, so about double the size. Um, current estimates also show that we're decreasing uh, the amount of flow through the Colorado River, and what does that mean? So uh, there's, that's a huge question to ask. At some point, we will reach capacity, or we'll figure out a way to magically make water. I think the first is probably the better, or more really. Um, but nonetheless, we're, we are going to have growth. And I can tell you right now, I, I don't think I'm going to live to see how to really deal with that problem, but I'm sure my kids are. And, and we, we do need to, as we consider... Is it, is it yeah. even a factor in all, in all your studies? Right? It's a factor in what IGT did, because we, we understood that natural resources were going to limit us. We had to grow in such a way. Again, it's a sufficiency thing. If we continue to spread out and out and out from, from valley wall to valley wall, that's more pipelines, that's more wastage, because there's entropy there. You're going to lose water. Uh, and, and, and all of those concerns. So, I mean, having a more compact space will, in fact, help us conserve that water and be much better. I think, um, I don't want to misquote who it was, but I did hear a pretty good quote a while ago. Uh, I, it was one of the council staff said, uh, I'm a conservationist. Of course I live in the city. And if you think about it, that makes a heck of a lot of sense. I and mean, we love our nature. We, we, 4,000 years of continuous human existence here, largely because we have six great reasons to live here. Uh, October, November, December, January, February, March, right? <laughs> and we can exist through the months in. But uh, people are going to want to continue to live here in some way, but we've got to make it in a way that is efficient to be able to do that and live with the nature, and we don't want to kill the goose that lay the golden egg. The, I, I know that doesn't answer your question, which is how are we going to deal with water? Because the real answer is we don't know yet. 
but we do know that we can set the stage to be able to deal with it in a more effective way than we can right now. How's that? Yes, sir. Well, and I really think the so, you know, salient point that uh, you talked about earlier was that currently we have about a billion dollars in uh, tourist dollars uh, from Mexicans coming up to visit Tucson, the surrounding areas, uh, just the sales tax and things like that. If we could open up the port of entry a little bit more and make that more available for people to come up here with the port of Wyoming and doing the four way connect there, there's a huge economic boom for local businesses. I know it's hard to tell, but I'm from Texas. And there's a saying in West Texas that, uh, that uh, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. When we kick that anthill, it is going to be big. But, we gotta, we, but you're right, we're going to have to deal with it. I, I just want to be able to help us set the stage so that when we deal with it, we're not, we're not having to backtrack and, 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 and recorrect problems. We've already been moving in an intelligent way. Yes, ma'am. Seeing that you're from Texas, what are, what are the chances that this highway goes through this highway will not go through Texas. This, the, Are you aware of what the oil fund is? Not off the top of my head, no. Sorry. The oil fund is a untouchable fund that the state of Texas owns that has been going on for, I don't know, 100 years probably. Oh, and then I know exactly what you're talking about. I went to the University of Texas and it was funded by that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that pays in great part for infrastructure. It's paid for Texas highways for since the beginning of highways. Correct. Mm -hmm. So the money is sitting there waiting. So let me finish the answer. So I-11 will... Any, uh, mm -hmm. you know, bond issues that have to be passed, they don't have to vote on it. No, and, 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 it. And, and by the way, they view it in a very, very bipartisan way. It's about business there, not about whether you're a D or an R. So I... I from Texas. Oh, goody. <laughs> Hi there. So, um... What we do know is I-11 is not considered to go through Texas. It, it, it just isn't. It's not going to cross the mountains. Where it goes through in either New Mexico... Well, no, but you were talking about the... Th that's the other part. I-35 already does. I-35 terminates in Laredo, Texas on the border. You cross the river, you're in Nuevo Laredo, and you've got the Mexican highway system that feeds into that. I-35 goes through Laredo, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas up through uh, Kansas City, makes a dog leg up through, but basically goes all the way up to Canada through, through uh, Minneapolis. So there's already a, I won't call it a Canamax Highway because that's not the designation, but there's already a route that competes for that. Now, the other reality is it is hard. You can't dodge around the Sierra Madre Mountains. They're huge. There's, you know, they're, they're as high as the Rockies here in right cutting across the central part of Mexico. So getting goods from Guaymas to Laredo isn't the best answer. It's not, it, it, it's not option A. But if we don't do something here, then it will become option A by default because there's no other way around. So that, that's the dynamic is ADOT looks at that and says, well, we don't want Texas to get all of that. So we have to put a road through somewhere. We're going to have to connect with Mexico somewhere. So Tucson's kind of the logical geographic answer. But if Tucson says no, we'll go somewhere else. And Yuma's on the table, Ajo's on the table, Benson's on the table. All of these other, and those are other, they're viable options. Again, they may not be option A, but they're an option. Yes, sir. Can you put up your other hand? Sure. I, I feel like kind of a magician at this point. Yeah, I was struck by <coughs> when you talk about the loop route. Yes. What I perceive is a future similarity between the areas of Loop 101 and the 51 in North Phoenix. Or what could potentially become something similar to that in Southwest Tucson? Maybe uh, an Ajo way becoming a parkway. Um, and so I'm just going to give a little feedback. I think go ahead. We would be naive to think that mass development would not occur along that corridor. I, I, also along I think you're right. I mean, if you left it to its own devices, I think that's actually true. Um, the, so we've got to figure out how to mitigate that, I think, if we don't want growth. Either. Now, I do believe, honestly, as well, that probably there will be growth around three points. Because if you're going to build a highway loop system like this, and this, again, not a transportation planner, this is just a guy who kind of looks at things and says, yeah, that makes sense to me. If you built that, it's going to have to have a T-intersection here. We do have to be able to facilitate freight back and forth along this route. 
So yeah, I think there'd be probably an exit there, and that's or you know somewhere along this way, and that is going to add that, and that's a trade-off we might have to make. What I would hate to see is a bunch of exits all along the way, you know, so that all we do is we just continue spreading out, and that's. I'm, I'm saying that from the perspective personally. I'm also saying that from, from the perspective of IGT and the people of the region that gave us the vision that said we want more compact. Right. So, you're right. That's a thing we have to address. Ma'am. Is there any other uh, geographic location under serious consideration? You kind of hinted a little bit about like around the Catalinas or something, or is that really the A? They, they really are being really very cagey about it and because they don't, they, they don't want there to be any foregone conclusions. I mean, they are going through a study process, and they're talking to the other communities and saying that are out there. I mean, I think it's, it's very realistic to say that Yuma is an option. And Yuma, the, I mean, there are meetings like this going on in Yuma where they're saying, yes, we want it out here. Uh, I think Ajo is an option because of, b because of the Gila Bend and, and just the way that I-11 may tee into things. Um, I think that Benson is a less likely option, but I tell you right now, Benson and uh, uh, Douglas and, and, and those areas south of there, they're very, very interested in having that because it's good for them. Now, that obviously deals with you know, the San Pedro River Valley and a whole host of other ecological issues and conservation issues, so I don't know how realistic that is, but they are options that are out there. So I, that's, that's being looked at. Uh, I'm sorry, gentleman in the back there. Yes, sir. So what does northern Mexico look like right now? It seems like Juan's Hermosillo, Nogales, is, it's already built, mm -hmm. where anything to the west is no man's land right now. So how would you connect Juan's to Yuma without building a, a desert you know, beach highway in Mexico? It'd have to. So, that we, so we're already set up to be in that port unless they build a whole new highway in Mexico. We are, except politically, and except for conservation measures, we are the path of least resistance just looking at geography alone. We always have been. That's the reason why we exist. But, again, and we have to live with those results, and so that's how the political... Not, again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying we're going to have to learn how to deal with that. Yes, sir? So on the back side of that, um, Imagine Bitter Tucson's got those nine other areas of, of importance. Sure. And so you just mentioned politically, environmentally, you know, sometimes those people get involved and make so much noise, yeah. that ends up being how we make decisions. And you mentioned the teenage thing a little. How are we looking at the other seven points, caring about elderly people that live there, health care, education, you know, other developmental issues that if we partner with Mexico more, you know, and, and you know, make all this work out, we can have a broader view of how we're going to go through all this. Otherwise, it'll be a heated battle and kink, you know. I, I think you just asked and answered my question for me. I mean, <laughs> honestly... You know, to drive all these things, to create the quality of life we want, there has to be an economic piece to it. You don't just say, we, you know, no to everything else and then hope an economy is going to happen. There are, and we've always talked about choices and trade-offs. So, if we want to build an economy that capitalizes on this, then we're going to have to make some choices and trade-offs in all those other areas. If we want to build an economy that doesn't capitalize on this, if we want to push it away, then we have to make the, al the alternative set of choices and trade-offs and decide how we're going to live otherwise. I'm, there was a question up. Yes, sir. So, Mike, this is kind of uh, hopping back around yeah. to your other map and the other loop route. But are there, and one of the things I love about IGT is the way there is often analysis of either competitor or other cities that have gone through similar things. Are there other case studies nationally where roads have been routed or legislated or drawn up in a way that would, uh, that would mediate the, the effects of the landowners squawking along the route as being excluded from having exits near them? Because if you... You know, if you say we're going to route this one big thing but only have one exit or two exits, there's going to be a lot of somewhat powerful landowners along those routes who will be very upset and it will become a huge political issue that you're cutting them off, et cetera, et cetera. But right. is there a way to construct that easement or whatever that takes care of that earlier in the legislative process? Or what are other cases? That's actually what Chuck, I believe, the way I read the language in his letter is proposing, is that it's a trade-off of conservation lands here, conservation lands around the, uh, around the, the proposed loop that would prevent there from being development along that loop. So there are ways to do it. And yes, there are other studies. I mean, let's face it, uh, every, every other big city that's a transportation city, and I'll point out Atlanta, and I'll point out uh, uh, Kansas City, I'll point out Chicago, have had to deal with these issues over time. And some have done it really well, some have done it really poorly. 
You know, we, we are often compared to Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas traffic is a mess. I will tell you that. There's a reason I am from Texas. Uh, <laughs> they didn't, they, they literally stuck their head in the sand, and I was there when it happened in the mid-80s and early 90s, and said, no, we're not going to build these things because it's just going to facilitate growth. Well, growth happened anyway, and now you can't drive anywhere. Um, I will also point out to you that, look at this from a Sun Corridor perspective. Anybody that's been to Austin or San Antonio, or more, more realistically driven in between this two, there's about 85, 90 miles of, of highway between there. When I left Texas in 1987, you would leave Austin city limits, there'd be a bunch of cows, you get San Marcos, there'd be some more cows, New Ground Fields, more cows, and you got San Antonio, and that was it. It was kind of boring. You drive there now, and it's a parking lot. It is just one end to the other of development. Now, we can look at that and say, is that what we want? I mean, huge tax base, makes a lot of money for the state of Texas and the local jurisdictions, but is it pretty? Is that how we want to grow? Or is there another way to do that that's smarter, that's more sustainable, that uses up less water, uh, that still gets us the benefits that we want? So there are a lot of lessons for us to learn from. Ma'am. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And for as long as I've probably been alive, uh, 49 years, uh, we have been wanting to connect um, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. That's a long stretch. It hasn't <laughs> happened yet. That uh, All we have is the... Uh, the turnpike, right? Toll, yeah, the uh, toll roads yeah. and turnpike. Um, a few years ago, finally, they connected 279 with, from uh, South Hills mm -hmm. to North Hills. Finally. <laughs> um, and it was all voter stuff and everything. Tucson voters. That's why we have to have these conversations. I, I, I have to, I could talk about this all day, except that I have an appointment at one in a minute. So I can, can only take one more question. But I would like to say before I do that, as I mentioned earlier, this is almost the inaugural session of community conversations and I really appreciate Inside Tucson Business and Gangplank for, for setting this up. Um, we will have more. There will be more opportunity to discuss, more opportunity to learn. Uh, if you uh, Don't go to my website yet because it's going to completely change here in the next two or three weeks. But if you like us on Facebook, you're going to see lots and lots of commentary coming on board. Uh, so please do. Magic Raider Tucson on Facebook. Um, and this, there will be more. More to follow. So one last question, somebody. See, I gave the warning and everybody started leaving, so we're good. <laughs> well, listen, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I will come and speak to any gathering of more than two people or more.